afternoon. I'm Gina Miller, SVP and General Manager of Entertainment One, and you are attending the virtual music industry session sponsored by Women in Music, a conversation with the leading women in the music business. Well, let's jump right to it. Let's start with brief introductions so you'll know who these powerhouse women are that you're looking at today. I, I don't know how my screen is here, but let's just start with Leslie. Thank you, Gina. Um, my name is Leslie Fram. I am the Senior Vice President of Music and Talent at CMT, and I oversee everything that has to do with music and all platforms at CMT. And we just finished uh, the CMT Awards in a pandemic, which was uh, interesting, but it was something that was really, really, really great to go through because now I have a whole appreciation, a whole new appreciation for people that do production and artists and it's a, it's a whole new brave world. But I'm excited to join the panel tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Portia? Hi, I'm Portia Sabin. I'm the president of the Music Business Association. We're a trade association in the music industry that covers pretty much a vast number of sectors of the music industry, the DSPs, the labels, the publishers, the tech companies, um, managers, uh, a huge number of, of, of groups. And uh, I think we have just finished 39 events over the last seven months, uh, which is a huge pivot because normally we would put on one conference a year. So uh, that I'm very proud of my team. I'm very proud of all of us. And we've made it to November without we're all we're all here in this room, and I'm I'm so happy to be with you guys. Molly, hi, I'm Molly Newman. I'm the president of Song Trust. Um, Song Trust is a global music publishing platform. Um, we serve mostly independent songwriters and producers. Um, we also work with companies and um, small businesses and publishers. Um, we also work with large companies like Downtown Music Publishing and uh, CD Baby. We power their um, CD Baby Pro publishing offering. Um, we are a little bit different in that we work with societies and services all around the world directly. Um, and I'm really glad to be here tonight. Um, I'm also a former active musician. I don't say I'm not anymore, but um, I um, got my start as a musician and I was signed to this record company for many years. Uh, it's, a, it's a great um, room to be in virtually with all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, we're gonna start. Leslie, I wanna tee up this first question for you. Wait a minute, did we talk about Cameo Carlson? Oh, uh, introduce Cameo. Cameo. Oh. Hello. <laughs> I know, right? I just, I mean, I was, I was. You're just so comfortable up. with me, Gina. I know, Cameo. Cam, okay, y'all, full disclosure, Cameo's my butt. You know, these women I love. But Cam, okay, Cameo, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. It's all good. I am Cameo Carlson. I'm the president of M Theory Nashville, which is a, a uh, management services company, uh, which is a weird way of saying we do strategy and marketing for artists um, of all genres in all parts of the world. And I come by this at a very strange and, and uh, interesting path that started uh, because I have no talent in music and got started in radio in college where Portia and I went together and graduated at the same time. Okay. Years. Yes. Long time ago. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so now it kind of feels kind of anticlimactic, but we're gonna go back to Leslie. <laughs> hey Leslie, so here, here's my question to you. Goodness gracious, and I feel like for all of you, I have so many thoughts about what you can add to this conversation. CMT, that's a whole question within itself, being in such a male dominated, I mean, we all are working in a male dominated industry, but for sure, I can only imagine some of what you face every day. But I wanna ask you this question. What about the emerging woman, the, the leader that's new to her job, fresh on the scene, walking in the door? What do you tell her, either from experience or what have you been told that you can share with her? It's interesting that you said that because I've, you know, we all do a lot of mentoring and a lot of people fresh out of college are, they don't really, I don't think they understand 
the whole networking process. And what I try to tell them is, especially in this music business in Nashville, it's such a small industry and it's so important to reach out and get to know people. And it, we're lucky in Nashville and Cameo, I know that, that you and Gina can attest to this. People are so willing to have a virtual conversation with you and before the pandemic to have coffee with you. And so I continue to try to, you know, open up and, and network with people all the time because we don't know anymore how long our jobs are gonna last. I mean, and so the people that get really isolated and they're in a job and they don't reach out and get to know other people, the minute that job goes away, you might not have 10 people that you can turn to and, and have a conversation with. So I usually try to tell them to make sure that they're constantly networking with people and even people outside of their circle. Okay. All right. That's good. So Cameo, how do we support women? How do we support young women? How do we support women at any age? How do we get women to understand the value in networking? Take any part of that and, and let us know what you think. I mean, I think that the, the, th the thing that we do that's very sort of um, appropriate for the group that is talking right now is that we are all women who actually support these young women and actively work towards helping them with mentoring and networking. And I think it's incredibly important. I, I feel like the there are a lot of women who don't have female bosses. So having some kind of outside mentorship with women in the industry, even if it's just to have somebody who understands what you're going through is really important. And we have to support each other. I think we're socialized into thinking that we're competitors instead of um, supporting each other. And that leads to this sort of doubling down of there isn't enough room for more than one woman at, at a senior level or at a specific company or in a specific role. And I felt that very early on in radio and throughout my career and, and always felt like it was a pay it forward kind of thing that the mentoring bit to me personally, and I know to the women on this conversation is important. That's what we have to do. Okay. Gina, can so I what, jump in on that one too? Sure, sure, sure. I think, you know, we've been doing, obviously we've been doing so many Zoom meetings this last seven months since we've all been in this pandemic. And I don't know about you guys, but I feel like every time I do one of these, I get a flood of emails from young women who are like, oh, I had no idea about your story. Thank you so much. It's so helpful to see you. So I think doing stuff like this is also really important in the mentoring process to be visible um, because otherwise, you know, if we're not visible, nobody knows, nobody's going to know our stories. It's, it's like pretty basic, but sometimes overlooked. But not being afraid to reach out either. I think when I was younger, I would have been afraid to reach out to some of the women that I saw speak or, you know, was fortunate enough to know about. And I laugh now and she doesn't remember it, but the only fan mail I have ever sent in my whole life was an email in probably 1999 to Leslie Fram because Leslie was the... Uh, program director at the alternative station that at the time for radio was just, it was the station. And I was so petrified to send that email and Leslie responded and I didn't write back. It didn't become like some big, you know, correspondence, but it was so important to me to know that someone like that would respond, that it gave me all this confidence anytime I wanted to reach out thinking, well, the worst thing that can happen is they just ignore it. And that's not so bad. I can deal with that. But it meant it meant a lot. It meant a lot. And I, you know, where that came from, Cameo, and I don't know if I ever told you the story or not, but, you know, when I was in high school and I, want, I was a baby DJ and I would send out air checks to people just hoping that somebody would get back to me and people did. And I was like, if I'm ever in a position, ever in a position to where I can pay it forward, like you said a minute ago, I'm going to do that. So I think that all of us do the same thing on this call. It's so important to pick up the phone. It takes five minutes or send an email or do a Zoom call with someone. And it, it can be overwhelming, but you just, you change people's lives that way. But what do we say to, you know, the young woman who has reached out to someone that's not one of us? You know, what do you say to the person that's trying to figure out how do I even start this pathway to find a mentor or what if I'm rejected or, you know, maybe the question is even, 
it's the advantage to have to look for to seek out a female mentor as a mentee or do men add something to the conversation that are is equally just as important molly you want to take that I see you sure talking. yeah no i i think that um certainly um there tremendous support of male colleagues um throughout my career journey um i you know reflecting listening to you all and thinking back on on how I got my start, you know, in the early 90s in independent record companies um, without, um, there weren't many visible women to Portia's point, um, you know, I really had to seek them out, but there were a tremendous number of um, supportive men and um, networking with them and, you know, maintaining uh, relationships and taking inspiration from what they did. And then hopefully, um, you know, doing it my own way has kind of always been the formula that I've tried to follow. Um, you know, acknowledging that someone's going to look up to you, like you were saying, Leslie, um, look, you know, look for your reference and your model. Um, and so taking risks and looking at, you know, ways that are, you know, going to a conference when I was early in my career where I didn't know anybody and, you know, halfway around the world and trying to, you know, walk my part um being sort of an indie punk rocker from the west coast it was that you know it, it required a little bit of um sort of a deep breath and and um you know channeling some inner confidence but i do hope that 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 is something that you know you you i project and then others might find that same sort of um personal inspiration because there is a little bit you know we all have to look inside too, to, um, to do what we're doing. Um, there are lots of good examples and there's more visibility and more discussion every day, which is an incredible change from, I think, when we all got our start. There's a really good point there, Molly, too, which is that this is an industry of confidence and ego. And you have to really like force yourself into positions that may not be comfortable for you naturally. But if you send out 10 unsolicited flattery emails, someone's going to respond. Someone in that list is going to respond and that can start that conversation and mentorship. And you just have to keep going if, if, you're, if you don't have anybody to start with. Okay, I heard the big C twice. Molly, you said the big, the big C word. Cameo, you said the big C word. Portia, I need you to help us understand. What's the, look at the C word is confidence. Confidence, uh, confidence, confidence, confidence. Yeah. I heard both of you kind of sneaking and sliding into your comments portion. Certainly, there's a measure of confidence as Cameo so eloquently charged us that we all have to have. Absolutely. What do you say about the difference between, or the definition, can you define for me in your words, the definition of confidence versus self-confidence? Mm, wow, that's a There's tough a one. That's a stuff. good one, Gina. We're going back to grad school now. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I, I really, I'm glad that confidence came up because I think this is a really important thing for us to talk about with young women, especially because I think a lot of times young women, especially, I mean, certainly when I was 19, 20, um, you don't have necessarily that just sort of confidence and swagger that sometimes men have just very naturally, like I deserve everything. So I'm going to be super confident. And, but, but we need to say, okay, it's all right if you don't naturally have confidence, self-confidence that's, you know, pushing you like, because that's your personality, but you need to find confidence somewhere. And someone very wise once told me, find something inside yourself that you are proud of, that you're good at, and use that to build the foundation of your confidence. And so when you start to get nervous about something, you go back to that place of, well, but I know I'm good at this and I feel confident about this in my life, whatever it is, doesn't have to be related to your professional life. And use that as the foundation to build your confidence because ultimately that's, that is true of everyone in the workplace. We are confident in that we present as confident, which means you walk into a room and you say, I'm someone worth talking to. I'm someone worth respecting, you know? And we do have to have that as women and as people in the world. It's it's critical. So true. I think that you know the, the whole idea of being able to define for ourselves why I feel that I'm confident is gonna require a lot of mirror work for everybody. I'm just gonna encourage you that are watching 
And it starts with affirmation. It starts with affirming what you know you can do. Because I think that there's the whole idea of maybe the major difference is proven work that you've done. And then the belief in yourself that you can do it. Which really is the big separation here is opportunity, right? So something that you haven't proven yet that you know that you have a belief that you can do. I mean, it really requires you being able to walk in there and say, I, I need the shot, <laughs> you know, I need the shot. So Leslie, to that end, when did you know that you were a leader? And I would love for all of you to answer that question. I think that this is a dynamic well, um, thought. I feel like the point I was gonna also make about what you were just talking about, Gina, is that I feel like we have to encourage people though, first and foremost, because sometimes I find that just a little bit of encouragement pushes them over the edge because they don't really see or have or feel that confidence. And I'm, you know, when I first got to CMT, I saw all these people on the music team that weren't able to own things. And I'm like, they need to own stuff and I need to empower them because they are experts. And I think they just needed somebody to tell them to do that and to encourage them. So I feel like that's almost the first step, you know, and that's with anything that's with, you know, cameo, that's like us talking to artists, right? There's so many artists that are so afraid to do this or send their music or reach out to a publisher. And it's like, you've got to take that first step. So I don't, I mean, I feel like one of my, one of my strengths, as a leader, and I learned this from, I mean, I have some great mentors, great mentors, is honestly walking in and letting people own things. I don't want the credit for it. I want them to have the credit for it and to own it and to really empower a team. And once I started doing that, I mean, you can just see how people open up and become confident. It's crazy how it works, but it's true. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I asked the question, when did you first know that you were a leader? And I asked yes. that you all answer that. So if you don't want to answer that one, I would say, what type of leader are you? No, I do it sounds like to me, you just defined really the type of leader and the leadership that you bring to CMT. I think I first uh, found out about it when I was um, programming radio stations. Uh, where there was a radio station I worked for for 17 years, which is unheard of because most people don't stay at one place for that long. But it was such a great team and it was a small team and we did a lot of work. But I think that's when I really first came into my own because I loved the, you know, you spend so much time with these people. They're really your family. And we did great things together. And I think that's when I really felt like I was a leader. And that was probably uh, in the early 90s, honestly, in the early 90s. Okay. Molly. You know, I was just thinking about that listening to Leslie, um, because I had a lot of responsibility early in my career, um, but I didn't, I wasn't really able to acknowledge the responsibility of leadership. Um, and, you know, I had a, a record company that I had partners with, but we had a pretty big staff for that time and that size, it was about 18 people. And, you know, looking back on where I was in my life and the experiences and skills that I had developed and that matched with that responsibility, I don't, although I'm sure that, you know, I was the, um, the boss of some of the, of the team then, I don't look at that time actively as like, that was my leadership moment. And it really did take a lot of ups and downs in my journey um, you know, and, and various moments of um, acknowledgement and recognition and, and even important roles. But I think I'm still getting, coming into my own and learning every day, um, you know, what this responsibility is, what, you know, saying one phrase sometimes can, um, that can be interpreted a certain way and, and you have to be, you know, the thoughtfulness that is required. Um, you know, about how you speak to people and how you communicate and how much you offer of yourself and how much you don't. I think that's a sort of a, an important skill um, that I'm still working on because I get close to people that I work with a lot. And, you know, that that is a great thing, but it's also can be kind of a burden um, for everybody. And um, so I think I'm still, I'm still on that journey. I certainly recognize my current leadership responsibilities and, you know, I, I kind of work on them almost every single day. Cameo? I, 
I don't think I knew when. Um, I was one of those kids that was really shy, but was smart. So there was sort of this like student leadership when I was young that people would tell me that I had, but I didn't necessarily feel it. And similar to Molly, there were some places along the way where I managed teams or I had responsibilities. And I don't think I knew that I was a leader until I left iTunes to go to a record label and inherited a team. And that was when I knew I was not one and I needed real training because what I had done as leadership at iTunes meant that if somebody came in and told me that their cat was sick, we'd both start crying and I would send them home. I didn't know how to actually deal with that. And when I got to the label, it was sort of in New York City, it was like the polar opposite of how to deal with that. And I think what it taught me was that I had some of this capacity naturally, but that for me, it was really about the style and defining that. I, I'd found that there were sort of this like, women in this industry were either an aggressive bitch or they were a doormat and there wasn't much in between. And so I very consciously took on that my style of leadership was based around empathy, which I don't think is the norm necessarily in the music industry, but for me, it's what felt right. It's so that I could lead and be as aggressive as I needed to be in that space, but still understand the human element of this, which is just so important, I think, to dealing with creatives that that has felt like I finally get that about myself, but not until now. There were bits and pieces along the way, but like with everything else in my career, every one of those was getting just a tiny little piece more to kind of get me to the place now where I feel much more confident in that. Portia? Yeah, I think leadership is one of those things that you, you develop over time. And I think it's also okay for that to be, for it to be a process. And I feel like we need to let people understand that you don't just wake up one morning and you're a leader, like you actually have to develop the skills over time. And a lot of it is learning by doing and learning by failing, you know, by having multiple failures. I mean, I ran a record label for 13 years and I'm here to tell you, I had messed up a lot. Like I look back and I'm like, why did I do that? <laughs> that was really dumb. That was not what I should have done. But, you know, you take those and you build on them and you, and you come into new situations and you have an, an opportunity to do better. And I mean, I like what Camille says about leading by empathy. I think that's totally true. I also think listening a lot is really important. And I also think um, for me, you know, I inherited a staff of nine people and my current goal is to help those nine people go where they wanna go, right? I feel like that's my, my job is to help them get to where they wanna go because they're all super qualified and, and really talented. So it's like, I wanna listen to them and say, what do you want? You know, are you happy now? Great, where do you wanna be in two years, five years? You know, this, this is the conversation that I need to have with them. And if, you know, if they need to be somewhere else in five years because that's where they are gonna excel, that's great too. You know, and my job is not to keep people in the exact same place for the rest of their lives. It's to, it's to help them move and grow. Portia, I love that you said uh, earlier about owning your failures because that to me is really powerful and owning it and telling people that you've failed because it's not all perfect and rosy. And I think that's another thing that is a, a really important thing to tell people that are just getting into their career is that you will fail by the way, and that's okay. Yeah, Leslie, exactly. you're, you're trying to take my number. My, I wrote, sorry, that down. <laughs> wrote that down on my pad. I wrote that down. You, and, you, I, and I, I'm going to tell you why I wrote it down. I went to, I was watching um, a, a conference on YouTube because I'm, you know, this is what we're doing now in this virtual world. We're watching, we're absorbing as much information, if not participating as much as we can. And one of the things that, you know, and we think these things, right? We talk about them to ourselves. I, I don't know how many times we share our failures. It's like putting the bad picture up on Instagram. Who does that? No one really, but we should. And I do agree that we should. And it really convicted me watching this leader talk about the fact that the biggest gift that they could have been given was understanding not only were they going to fail, but what that could look like and how they could get out of it. So I, I just think we should just sit here for a second, a quick second, and whoever wants to take it, my question would be, what do you, how do you begin again? How do you get up from failure? How, how do you even prepare for the possibility of failure? 
Well, I will tell a funny story because I love this story. And now, and it's also like good to see how the arc happens, right? So one time, this was, I don't know how many years ago, um, I did an interview with a woman who had gone to my grad school and she had been in my program in my grad school. So that was like our connection, which is an anthropology program. I mean, this is like very sort of removed from music. She wanted to talk to me about Paola on the radio. And I was like, okay, you have to understand, I've never worked in radio. So I'm, I'm like, like kind of a third party person. And she's like, I don't care, I don't care. You're in the business, I wanna hear about it, right? So she shows up in my office to interview me and she's got a hand puppet. So I gave an interview to a hand puppet Okay. And she said, you know, she asked me questions and I answered my question, whatever. Anyway, 18 months later, I wake up one morning and there's a story on billboard in billboard, Portia Sabin says Spotify is terrible and hates Spotify and Spotify is the worst company in the world. And I was like, what? Turns out she had gone like she had gone on sabbatical and had never posted this and then 18 months later had posted this tiny little video of me talking to a hand puppet and i got a phone call from steve savoka who was at spotify at the time to tell me what a terrible thing i had done and now many years later steve savoka is at apple and he's on my board at music biz so everything's okay but oh my god i wanted to die i was like <laughs> Give an interview to a hand puppet and your career is over. So it's a great story. That's a great story. Great story. Molly, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I was thinking about a really hard time that, you know, when my my record company was we had sort of made the call that it was time to to shut it down, uh, which was hard for infinite reasons, you know, really devastating. And I was on the board of HOIM um, with the sort of, it was the first two years. Um, the, the first president was a person named Don Rose, who some of you might remember. And I remember calling him and saying, you know, you know, our label isn't gonna work out. I have my own little small label still, and we're kind of working on how to maintain the catalog. And, um, and Don said something to the effect of, you know, we can't, we don't just abandon our people when they're down. Part of what we're trying to do, and this was the very early days of HYM, was support the, the independent label community and to lift, uh, lift one another up. And that was a really meaningful, poignant um, moment for me um, because I was so embarrassed. You know, I was really like, this is just horrifying. I don't know how to look, you know, to keep my head high right now. Um, and, uh, it, it was really incredible to have that kind of message. And I've never clearly never forgotten it, um, 15, 16 years later. Um, and it's, you know, it's, I think it's, a, it's really those, that lesson and that, that heartbreak of, of, you know, the company not working out something I'm in touch with almost every day, um, because it has really kept me humble things can happen to all of us um, and they're really hard but you know there there are new opportunities to to um, recover from and so that's you know something that's been really meaningful to me so there's been a lot of history made this weekend i'm just gonna turn the yeah. to another corner <laughs> um and i mean really and truthfully it's sad some days to me that we are still at a place where we have to celebrate women making history, period. Like it's just some of these things, you know, are given, but then there's so many other moments that we are absolutely celebrating. And you go, really? We This is a first as a woman for this? Still, you know, but here we are. This is where we are. And so I'm going to pause right now and celebrate each of you in your roles. Like, I don't know if it was historic, but it, I certainly can imagine that there's some level of your journey has been. And if not, from where you are right now, hey, the sky's the limit, right? And so you, cool, thank cool you, to, Gina. Cool thank you. And you too. Thank you for the journey that you've, I mean, presidents, presidents, senior leadership, executive <laughs> leadership, like founding organizations. Where's our champagne? We I mean, really, I feel like, I do feel like there, I mean, a virtual toast should certainly be happening uh -huh. right now. But it does lead me to wonder about roles and respect. 
And there's a lot that we can certainly talk about when it comes to the roles that you're in, the titles that you have, the work that you're doing, and the respect that you deserve that, that goes right along with it. In the workplace where you are, in the organizations that you are running, how do you manage or cope or deal with or receive you know, the respect or lack of respect in your role? And what advice or what do you have to say? It may not be advice, it just may be a story or something you would like to share. I would love to know and hear how you handle that and do we still have much more to go? Like, how do you, do you feel we're, we're making strides um, or is there a lot of work still ahead? There's still a ton of work ahead. Every year when the, when the Billboard Women in Music comes out in December, I, I have this internal battle of being happy that there's an acknowledgement of, of how things have progressed and what's changed and angry that that's even still a thing that is to be celebrated to your point. And I think, you know, I'm very fortunate in the role that I am now that I feel like I have gotten to a place in my own personal development where I feel like I can command certain amounts of respect. Um, and I'm not afraid to sort of take it when necessary, which I could not have done when, when I was younger. But it has come at a cost. I, I often sort of laughingly talk about the fact that the 25 year old version of me would be mortified at what the over 40 version of me has accepted and been okay with over the years, right? That like when you're young and you're indignant and you would never let somebody talk to you like that or do this thing. And then in this industry, as with many industries, but in this industry, you sort of come to a reconciliation with what you're okay with what level of that was a joke or, you know, a million different things that we could list that you sort of have to come to terms with so that when you fight your battles, they're more impactful. And I really hope that younger women don't deal with it nearly as much, but, you know, even moving to Nashville for me, which, which now is, I've been in Nashville full time for more than 10 years. And I remember thinking that I had sort of seen and heard all of it. And, and that first time that I was called honey in a meeting was so mortifying to me because in some ways that felt more disrespectful than almost more blatant things that had happened in my career somehow because I had just left a position as the executive vice president of a label group and I'm in a meeting and it's just, it's so strange to me. But I think you have to get to a place, even if you're faking it to begin with, where you command a certain level of respect and you figure out what you're comfortable saying and doing in order to command that. And I think I just, I just wanted to jump in there. <laughs> well, because, you know, it's like, we have a lot of responsibility to mentor young women for sure. But I think we also have a big responsibility to mentor the young men that we work with, you know, and, and who are on our staffs and who report to us because, you know, I've done a lot of that where I have conversations with my staff where I say, you were on a phone call with women who are 20 years older than you and you were interrupting them constantly and you can't do that. That is disrespectful. You know, you must understand, you know, I get it that you're enthusiastic and you have something that you want to say, but they are your, they're your seniors and you ha must have respect for them. You know, you can't just talk over them. Um, so it's important for us to have those conversations as well with the young men, because we do have, I mean, we're, they're going to look up to us whether they want to or not, because <laughs> we're the boss. I think um, kind of leading off of what Cameo was saying about we have a, a long way to go. When I moved here nine years ago, I was coming from a different format. I was coming from the rock format. And my first year, I was shocked at the lack of support women were getting and it. I just couldn't believe it. And the fact that we're nine years later and the numbers have actually gone down proves that there's a lot more work to be done. And so, yes, would I not like to have a next women of country franchise? Probably, but right now I have to because it's a way to expose artists with their content and touring and everything else. And I hate that we're there, but it's at, the numbers have actually gone backwards. So I feel like we have a long way to go and we have to keep fighting this battle. 
Molly, you want to add anything there? No, I think, um, you know, those are all such astute observations. Um, and I, I do think that the, the example we set um, for all genders, you know, in our, in our community, it's really, it's really important. And I think about that, you know, that there is like a, a, probably a charged responsibility, maybe an extra burden of, of, um, you know, trying to be perfect and trying to aspire for never making a mistake and, um, you know, never losing your cool. Um, there's just, there's the extra things that we, we probably, um, don't forgive ourselves for when we make mistakes, um, you know, in the daily day to day that, um, you know, I'm trying to really be a little bit more generous with myself about those things um, and try and try to not repeat them. You know, that's my, my main goal is, you know, mistakes are fine, but let's try not to do the same one over and over again. Okay. So <laughs> there, there's a lot of going on around um, social justice right now. I think that every day I'm having a conversation about diversity, inclusion, equity, equality, almost to every part of where I'm connected. I don't know that we can escape it right now. So let's deal with it a little bit. What are you doing, whether it's personally, um, part of a company or organization that brings awareness or creates advocates or brings just action to the changes or some level of change that we should be seeing right now around the subject um, diversity and inclusion. Camille, you wanna start? Yeah, um, I mean, I it's gonna sound like a laundry list because I think at my core, I don't know what all to do, right? And I think that was made very clear to me earlier this year as it was for a lot of people when we all got focused in the same moment on the same thing that was happening and the impact that, that George Floyd made. And I felt like I was somebody who always thought about and fought for this and then realized that I was not active in that fight at all. And that there was way more that I could do that would be more active. And so, um, you know, you and Leslie and I are all part of Nashville Music Equality, which is incredibly important. And I think we had a moment in time where we put something together for the industry to be able to reflect on that moment and Blackout Tuesday that, that uh, came out of that. Um, and it's something that I'm really proud of, but I think the most impactful thing for me was both starting a diversity and inclusion uh, team within my own company um, and just being really reflective and doing work that is super uncomfortable and hard for me, thinking that I was a progressive person and then reading some books and watching some films and even simple things like following different people on social media to realize how much of a bubble I was living in thinking that everything was fine because from my position of privilege, I could think that. And that has been really impactful and will be something I'm working on for the rest of my life. But it is, it is much more of a focus for me than it has been. I would agree. And I think Gina, you've been such a great help with Nashville music equality. I'm still learning. I know that um, I work for a company, Viacom, that they walk the walk and talk the talk all the time. And I know that I've been getting involved with some of the things we're doing internally. But also, you know, when they send out resources, I'm like, now I'm like paying attention. I'm, I'm doing what Cameo said she's doing. I'm attending panels and reading books and watching documentaries. And it's been life-changing, quite honestly. And I get more, I get more personal satisfaction out of what we're doing sometimes with Nashville music equality than most other things that I'm doing. The other thing that because uh, we started this thing called Equal Play at the beginning of the year at CMT where our video hours are all 50-50 and we're now making sure that there's equality in that mix as well. And I'm really proud of that. But there's still, there's still so much more to do. 
Um, Molly, you want to add anything or Portia? Yeah, the, the, you know, it's been wonderful to be part of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee at Music Biz um, with Cameo and Portia um, and a number of others um, in, in on the Music Biz board. And at Downtown Music Holdings, our, our company, Zontras is part of the downtown group of, of companies. We've been doing um, company-wide trainings um, on a number of topics around allyship and identity and other things that that you know having sort of started my when I went to college I was you know studying these sorts of things and I, I like you know maybe like you said cameo sort of felt like I had been working on a number of these things for as long as I can remember but there's still more to learn. There's there's new ways of thinking that have definitely expanded my um, my the acknowledgement of my own position and privilege um, in my life and um, how that is um, you know affects my day day to day. And and we're really looking at it a lot in terms of our team, our executive team, our the whole journey of of the career path at our company. What our uh, internship um, you know, funnels are what um, the recruiting practices are, um, expanding those actively. I mean, it's it's really, um, I think, transformative um, for our company and I think for our industry. I think it's time that we all really invest in it. And and for I think the the, the industry will see the value um, and the results of that work. We're going to be we have a, a diverse. Diversity is, is omnipresent in music, um, but it's not balanced. And, um, and you know, feeling like there's a real active um, concerted, effort, concerted effort across the industry and across the world uh, right now is, is really feels very um, gratifying, but only the beginning. Definitely lots, lots of other, lots of work to do. For sure. I think prioritizing um, diversity in the workplace and on your, like, for example, we're, we're a nonprofit, so we're run by board, you know, we, and thank goodness I have Cameo and Molly on my DEI <laughs> committee to help us plan, you know, but we're, we're doing a lot of recruitment to the board and, and, you know, we're, we have a plan for, you know, the next few years, we're going to, as people cycle off, we're, We'll have board elections, but we're we're creating a diverse pool so that we can make diversify our board very actively, you know. And I and I feel like I'm also learning by example, looking around the at what other industries are doing and what other folks in our industry are doing. I don't know if you guys saw the um, the little hour long documentary on the making of the Mandalorian, which you know it's a Disney show, it's a Star Wars show, and my husband's really into Star Wars, so we were watching it, and I wasn't thinking about it. And they actually recruited seven directors, uh, two women, um, two men of color, uh, and, and they did it deliberately. And then they had, um, and then they had them all share the directorial uh, chores for the whole season of The Mandalorian. And I was like, that's how you do it, people. You just do it. You know, and I feel like that's such a lesson for all of us in this industry, especially those of us who are in positions where we have hiring power, you do it. You don't talk about it, you do it. So, you know, that's a huge, huge thing for me to, to think about in my day-to-day -day life that I have the power to do something to make change, so let's do it. I heard someone say earlier today, is the apprehension that people are worried about losing their jobs? Are men afraid that this, is, this moment in time is going to cost them what they've worked so hard to create. Um, I also, you know, I, I was thinking about that and I thought, well, there's also an expansion of this table. I mean, there's seats, right? <laughs> there's seats around the table for sure. No, I don't know that anyone has to necessarily give up their seat. I think there has to be some restructuring and reimagining of how you just expand the table. And that means just bringing more seats to it. So I, I wonder, is that part of what's happening for those who are still lacking in being as progressive as we know that they have the power to be, even, in, even with women? I mean, what do we say about not just the development of and the creation of more seats, but what does secession look like? Like, how do we deal with 
these type of things right now in our industries. I love that image. I have not heard that before, the sort of adding the extender to the table um, and not just adding- I mean, you know, it's Thanksgiving is around the corner, Molly. There's a leaf in everyone's <laughs> closet, right? I, it's you know, house. but it's, it's really, it's really poignant, I think, to think about, you know, yeah, well, let's, let's add more seats, not That's just it. replace a seat. And that is a different um, fundamental way of thinking that it took an amazing black woman maybe to make that suggestion for us all to hear. And that's, you know, I think where, if we don't have conversations that include all experiences and all perspectives, we lose. That's yeah. the bottom line. Well, I think even in that conversation for me personally, it was a thing of, I don't want to take anyone's seat. Let me say that I, I don't want to take anyone's space. And I certainly don't want something just given to me for sure. But that's a whole nother, that's another panel for another day. Yep. One of the things I've been seeing <laughs> happening a lot in our industry, sort of across all the different companies, is that when someone like this just happened last week, someone retires and then two people are hired for the job. Yeah. There have been these sort of team heads. And I love that. I've seen I'm seeing that all over the place. Spotify has that in place. So a bunch of labels have that in place. Like it's really that's a really exciting model. Because I think that that brings us, um, it helps us understand that a diversity of perspectives is critical to the process, you know, and it's sort of a beautiful thing. And really, I don't remember that 20 years ago. I don't remember 20 years ago, the idea of, of a team of team heads. Of yeah, I've seen, I've seen it quite a bit, actually, in, in R&B for sure. And mm -hmm. Gospel, I think Motown also right now their inspirational division has co-executive leadership. So I've, I've seen it a few times for sure, That's but great. it's certainly not the norm or the standard per se. So Gina, I think, Gina, you need to start a Room at the Table podcast. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Is there Room at the Table? People should not feel threatened. It should be an opportunity. No, it should be well, an opportunity. They, they, I, I do think that there is a, an element of that, Gina, that is unconscious, right? Like white men in leadership in certain industries are being one of them, there's just sort of probably an unconscious need to preserve your place and to be the person who's in leadership because it's always been that way. So even if they're not consciously thinking that you would take their place at the table, there, there's this little reptile part of the brain that probably doesn't want to expand the table or isn't thinking about it that way, right? And so we have to continue fighting for all of that to happen around us. And I feel like, I mean, this is where I will wave the flag. I feel like so much of this work right now, at least where I see from my vantage point is being driven by women. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna say you brought up the word unconscious. So my, and I know I'm supposed to be asking you all the questions, but my little ask for everyone watching would be to find some unconscious bias training whether it's done live, whether it's done virtually, whether you just go to YouTube and do a simple search, find some, take, take heed to the suggestions, you know, see what you can learn and take from what you've heard. Because typically my sentiment is that a lot of what we're dealing with when, we, when it comes down to this work of change and transformation, and, you know, social justice, diversity, equity, any of it, all of it, making room for someone else who especially doesn't have your experience or doesn't look like you. People who don't identify, it's that's natural to not identify with something you haven't experienced. That's, that is human, I think. Um, but what happens is, I, you know, we look at, Camille, you were so eloquent when you opened this up with your opening statement about it. If we look at all of these things as extraordinary because they haven't happened to you or anyone that you know, I think it's hard to recognize where the blind spots are for you a lot of times, right? So just for an example, for someone who's saying, well, I'm not racist, no one in my family's racist, my community's not racist, because Charlottesville was racist, right? The people charging down the streets in Virginia, that was those were acts of racism that someone who would not know that they were racist could identify and say, but I'm not that, right? And so then we look at a whole list of things. So you have Armand Arbery, George Floyd, you've got Sarah, Sandra Blaine, all these incidents 
are for people to look at and say, well, this is not what I'm doing. This is not what people I know are doing. We aren't part of this problem. So surely we are not racist, right? But the unconscious bias and the implicit things that happen day to day in corporate America, in corporate America and in our organizations and in our companies and in our grocery stores <laughs> are, and gas stations are the things that we need most recognized right away, I think. I think that it's very difficult for people to see what CNN, MSNBC, what the news is portraying as the worst of America and not see, it's easy to not see yourself in that. But how you see yourself in when you invite other people to the table and how you feel about the seats being added and someone going to the closet to grab the extender to make the table longer or wider is the question you should be able to answer. And so that's my little slide in on that for us who are, are here assembled today. I love it. Uh, Great. So speaking of questions, here's, the, here's, here's my next question. What question, let me see how I'm gonna phrase this. What question do we have for the music industry or what statement do we think the music industry should be making 12 months from now? What question do you have for the industry or what do you see, what do you think we should see differently now in, tw in 12 months? I, I am sort of a broken record on a couple of topics. Sorry, Cameo and Portia, but I really do think that it's important for our industry to come clean with where we are, where what our numbers are, what our balances and imbalances are on every dimension of diversity. So, you know, all race, ethnicity, gender, um, you know, every sort of, everything that is, it's a, that can qualify and we can understand about where we are. Um, that, I would love to see that in a, in a year. At least this is where we are. And so, maybe- So does that, does that look like, Molly, like is that a website with all the data and metrics upload? Is that a big book we go, I mean, what, what does that look like something terrible? Yes. Because, okay, well, hey, I'm asking because I'm your girl. Like, we can figure out how to get this thing started and get this information centralized. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a commitment from companies and it's work and there needs to be some coordinated effort, obviously, and it's not it's not easy, but there are models and there are examples um, that are happening that we can get some inspiration from. But I also think that the, would then we as an industry, industry commit to some measurable improvement over the yes. next you know, in the five, 10, 15, however long it takes to get to, to get more balance and uh, in, in the industry. And I think that that is what, I would love to see some progress on that. I'll, I'll do the work too. I'll be, I'm, I'm okay, there. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm here for the measurable um, accountability. And, and we have to, I think we can't be afraid of that because how will we know how much progress your word, how much progress have we made if we don't know, one, where we started from. So I think it also involves, you know, so for everyone who doesn't have that, those metrics right now, the simple look around works, right? If you can just look around where you are and be honest, because you said honesty, you said just come clean about where we all are and, and figure out how to start from where you are. Any, anyone else want to add something to that? Well, it almost, you know, Molly, it almost sounds like, you know, like an Annenberg study, you know, how they did the Annenberg study for film and TV. Yeah, exactly. Radio yeah. And, and it is out there for everyone to see. And I really feel like that's a, that's a really amazing start. Honestly, where yeah. are we? Where are we? Yep. A real... and really, really, truly acknowledging it. I mean, this is an industry that makes a lot of money and always has on the backs of cultures that we then do not support and give resources to from an industry infrastructure perspective, right? And I think there's a lot of feeling that that is self-imposed, right? That I work in this genre and I look and feel like this and I have put myself in this place and it's just not true. We're just not, we're just not honest about that and where we build you know, dynasties off of cultures that we then don't support. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to go here because I don't want us to run out of time. It's so much. To t- Can we do this a whole nother extra hour? <laughs> so, so much I want to ask, like so, so much. We'll do a part two. We have to do a part two. If nothing else, we'll just get on Zoom ourselves and do it if, if, they don't, if, if no one else wants to hear the part two. I, I have to say, I'm a mom of two sons. And I was invited to speak to a young women's circle um, these were young women who were coming into the music industry. I guess it was a mentor circle. And let me just tell you what happened. And then this is going to set us up. All the young ladies went around the room. Some were, you know, different places, artists, you know, writers, wherever they were. And we were there. There were a few of us executives there who were there to, you know, provide some hope and inspiration and encouragement. And I literally started the circle and we went around and we got halfway around the circle and the young lady introduced her name and she immediately went into tears. And I thought, oh my gosh, what has happened here? You know, boy, it's been a tough journey, but no, let me tell you, she said she has children and she has a husband and she wants to be an artist. And she just said that None of that was difficult for her except being a mom. The being a wife was easy. So far, she's getting, you know, opportunities to be an artist that she never could have dreamed of. But she said that she finds so much, so far, the most difficult part of these steps for her was that she was a mother. And let me tell you how it convicted me. During my introduction, I never once said that I was a mother. And so I literally interrupted and said, y'all know, Cameo and Leslie know I would do a good interrupt. (laughs) I interrupted and I said, I need to introduce myself again. And I started my introduction over and talked about being a mom. So the second thing that happened is going to lead us to this conversation. Part of a conversation with other executives, very established, like, and one of them created this path of conversation about being committed to her family first, family first, family first. Nothing came in the way of going to children's games, going to, you know, do date night with husband, all these different things. If it was work related, she canceled her calendar, you know, and made time for family. I, on that panel, ended up saying that wasn't my story. I missed a lot of things. I, I, I missed a lot of things when it came to both of myself. I wasn't at every football game. I wasn't at every basketball game. I, you know, I didn't go to every band concert. And I made a choice though. I made the choice to do that. And it's interesting, the choices that we make and even, even more so, I will put this out here that During that time, my beginning of the industry, I was married, somewhere along the way, (laughs) became divorced. And so had to, I felt that I had to um, say that to them in a way that, you know, none of this you plan for. You don't plan to be that person. But the thing about when I walked into the industry that I knew that I didn't have the luxury of doing, and no one, these were unwritten rules. No one told me this. No one made me feel I couldn't divulge that I was a mom and I had a sick kid at home and couldn't go on the road. These were standards that somewhere along the way I set for myself. Somewhere I said, I don't want them to think that I won't be present and I can't do the work and I can't, and I've got a list of those things. I have a list of the things that I told myself that someone was going to think about what I was bringing to the table and what I would, you know, how I would be negligent in my work if they knew that I had these other responsibilities. Now, fast forward (laughs) 17 years later, I am encouraging my team as much as I can to really take that family first approach. And for those that don't have families, create some time for social life. Like you won't have a family if you're so committed to work more than you are developing relationships with people who are not working, (laughs) who are not part of your work. So my question is, how do we, how do we, how do we get there? How do we help young emerging or entering this industry, young people understand 
the balance between work and life. And is it still a thing? And is it acceptable? Like I'm, I, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. Like I, I don't know that it's acceptable yet, but how do we encourage them? What is your discipline? Like how do you get it out of your own life? And I know now that we're in a pandemic is a little different. We, we, and maybe not. There's also some thought that all of us are working harder and harder at home than we ever were in the office, in our physical locations outside of the home. So tackle any of that that you feel is necessary, is, is necessary for someone coming into this to know and to understand as they are going to have to figure out how to either balance it all out or is there a give, or is there a give up? Well, I, I would say, Gina, that uh, I have kicked people out of the office. I have told people, you need to leave now. You need to take some time. You know, is next week good for you? Is the you know, week after that? But you need time and you need to go. Just like, okay. get out. I'm gonna be honest, I had to grow to that. I literally had to grow to that. I think my team now probably appreciates me more than they may have some time ago because I really, you know, they're taking vacation now. And even last year, and I'm not disturbing anyone on vacation. Now I wasn't always that person, Leslie. I'm gonna be honest. I, I, I'm the, I'm gonna test it out. And see, let me send this little text and see if I can get this one piece of information. But, but truthfully, I'm really working hard to be better, <laughs> to be better. And when I do send those emails at 3 a.m., I usually put the little asterisk and say, I'm not expecting you to comment. I'm having insomnia and I can't sleep, so I'm working. But don't answer this, you know, or I've told them beforehand, but, but it's a real thing. And I'm hearing other stories from, I'm laughing a little bit about it, but I do hear very scary stories from some of my friends who work in other industries. And I know those same stories are happening in our industry in, in different capacities. So what are the tools, Leslie? I know, I know you're I'm, having fun. Well, it's funny because it's, I'm not a mom, but I think it's been ingrained in women for years. I mean, it's societal. Look at movies. You win movies and it's still like the woman who's got a family is like, oh, she's, you know, she's not going to be available. It's just been put out there. Talk about bias. It's insane. Well, I, well let's say this, not, not even being a mom, being a girlfriend, being a wife, being, yeah. you know, what, whoever you are, if it's, Something that includes family and loved ones, that still has to find, you still have to find a way to balance out the time to spend and make those moments significant. Well, listen, I, I go back to when I was in my 20s and I have so many regrets because it was, to me, it was like tunnel vision, career, career, career. And I remember I didn't take vacation days. I like, you know, didn't keep up with my friends. I didn't keep up with my family. And looking back, it was a real mistake. Now, I'm still not a balanced person. I still struggle with that every day. But looking back, that was, you know, that was something that was really dangerous. And I do tell people, you've got to take time for your family, your loved ones, your friends, because, you know, it, in a blink of an eye, like 20 years goes by. So I honestly look back on that and try to share that with people that I mentor today, that it's, it's important to take that time. It's funny when I moved to Nashville too, I didn't realize the whole Nashville thing that, you know, you don't email people after 6 p.m. You don't email people on the weekends. And I came from radio, right? Cameo where it's 24 seven. And even now on the weekends when I'm working, I have to put everything in a draft because I don't want to email anybody because you get no emails on the weekend. It's mm -hmm. still a struggle to this day. So let me switch on the balance question because I there's another type of balance that I think that we can help someone. The balance of where you work versus where you want to be. And that could be as an entrepreneur, building something alongside your day job. I don't know if any of you have that experience, but or or starting something and trying to needing to work somewhere else to fund your dream to do something else. How, how, what one piece of advice would you give to the person who's watching who's in that position? I, we had a great panel not that long ago with a manager who said, be the CEO of nothing. Even if you've got, you know, you got nothing. So you're the CEO of nothing. Like you be, that's your job. Like you have an entrepreneurial idea. 
just own it and, and, and declare that for yourself. Like I'm the CEO of, you know, me corporation, whatever the heck it is. I haven't figured it out yet, but I'll get there. And I think that that's such good advice because, you know, as everyone in this room, I'm sure knows, there's a huge difference between being the boss and being an employee. And it's actually really kind of scary how different it is because your perspective completely changes when you're the boss, you're, you look at everything completely differently. And it's weird because you're like, but we're in the same room. We should be friends. But you guys are looking at me and I'm the, I'm like the bad man. Like I'm the big bad guy. And, and it like, it's hurtful, you know, you're like, oh, I, I don't want to be seen this way. But then, you know, over time you can, you can kind of get with program. But I think if, if everybody is the CEO of their own thing, it helps because it puts you in that position of, okay, I am the responsible person. I am the person who's in charge. Right. Even if I have a day job where I am an employee. Right. I think that does help because you can sort of get both perspectives. So I love that because it makes me just feel like, you know, we should be empowering really everyone wherever they are to just be the entrepreneur and CEO of where they are right now. Exactly. Well, and especially if that's if that's the focus where you then don't have balance right between a work life that feels more like you're building something for yourself, because I'm challenged by the dichotomy for women, where how do you tell a young woman to have balance and to own it right because my advice always is if you don't carve that out and don't take your vacation days nobody else is going to come behind you and tell you you need to do that with rare exceptions right Porsche being one of those, but at the same time, we also tell women, and we are taught from a young age in every industry pretty much, that we're gonna to have to work twice as hard to prove that we deserve a seat at that table, right? And so how then do we figure out how to mentor young people into thinking that women in particular, that that's okay, you know? I like the idea of if you're gonna work twice as hard, that it's for something that you're gonna own at some point. I love that narrative. I don't think I would have listened to that advice when I was young because I didn't ever see myself being entrepreneurial, even though along the way, things I was doing actually were entrepreneurial. I didn't think of it that way. So I think we have to, we have to also sort of battle that conversation with, with young women. Do we want to touch on sexism a little bit? I think we shall. Yep, I'm answering the question. We shall. <laughs> Are we going to end that, on sexism? That, We're going to end this lovely panel with sexism. I it. mean, just one. I think just one person should just speak to an experience or advice how to deal with it because it's present. It's it's present and prevalent. I think we can't we we can't be a, a panel of women who are empowering other women without just making mention of it in a small way. Part of the reason that I started Digital Divas uh, when I got to Nashville was because I felt like I didn't have anybody to tell when I had bad experiences. And part of what we were trying to do was create a safe space to know that even if you couldn't deal with it or fight back, that you were not alone in that moment. I was told when I was 24, 25 years old, that the reason I did not get a promotion was because I didn't have a penis. Literally told me if I had a dick, I could have, I could have argued harder. And I did not know what to say. Now, of course, I have 75 comebacks for, for that. But in the moment, I was so scared and horrified and shocked that it was said that blatantly that I turned around and I walked out and I burst into tears and had no idea what to do and was in a position where I either had to, um, I, I would love to have been super indignant and gone back and quit my job, but there were not, there was not another job in that industry for me in this small town that I was in. So my choice was either I pay my rent and I suck it up and I keep going, knowing that my boss felt this way or I walk out and feel very, you know, gratified that I've taken the high road and have no rent to pay. So it's something that was very formative for me as a person. I wish that it was the thing that I would never do again and had never gone back and felt like that again. There were plenty of times I felt like that, but that was the most obvious one to me that made me really think about they're needing to always be a space where women know that they're not the only one that's dealt with that in probably in any, in, in any industry. 
Right. Okay. So creating community is what you basically did with Digital Divas. So I'm just going to go around the room for everyone else. And maybe before I do that, Cameo, if you won't even add, I would love for this question since you started with that to be what community, what place, whether it's a resource that has been something that you have been able to utilize, or maybe it's your own organization, or maybe it's something you're part of that you can share with everyone watching. Um, maybe you just want to tell us, you know, the, the handles that we can go to find more information about where you work, whatever you want to share related to community. Um, and that could, those women that are watching could be a part of said community. I would love for that to be one thing that we end on. So Cameo, give us, you know, a handle or, or where we can find you and maybe Digital Divas and whatever. Yeah, Digital Divas Nashville, um, especially now in, in COVID times, it's not Nashville centric. We do a lot of Zoom things, um, but it is primarily for networking uh, with other women and for sharing and mentoring uh, so that you have a space to talk about things. I did not have a single female boss in my career. And there was something about that that I felt like I could not explain things, you know, in, and stuffed it all down and found that my girlfriends were good outlets for that, but they didn't understand the nuances of this industry. So I think there are a lot of resources and communities that you can join. That's one for me that, you know, I'm quite proud of. Okay. Portia, you have one you want to share? Um, in terms of resources, I think women in music who are sponsoring this panel are, are really terrific. They're a national organization and, and, you know, you certainly are going to find people at all levels throughout that whole, you know, I mean, people who are just entry level, first time on, you know, job in the music industry to executives, um, which is great. So it's a good community and it's, and you're going to get a good range of people to talk to. I mean, I don't really know what to say about sexism because I feel like that's like, let's talk about air, right? Like, Mm -hmm. It exists. You have to deal with it. It's all around us. It's, it's part of our culture. You know, it's like racism. It's, you know, and it's going to affect different people at different times. I think the thing that's upsetting about all forms of oppression and injustice, sexism, racism, etc., is that it sneaks up on you and you don't know it. It's going to happen. Like you can be happily the president of a company and feeling like, you know, wow, I'm really old and I'm pretty in control and everything's cool. And you can turn around one day and someone can just say something to you and it just smacks you in the face in, and it puts you in that terrible place in your emotions, just like it did the first time, you know, that's the power of these uh, cultural oppressions, right? Um, and I think that's the part that, that we have to try to help each other through is just, it's not you, you're not, there's nothing wrong with you. It does hurt and it does feel terrible. Um, the one thing that gives me hope about this is, you know, over the years, I feel like the people I've run into in this industry who have been sexist to me, um, their businesses don't do as well and they go away over time. You can watch it or they change. Mm -hmm. I've also seen businesses change, you know, where they have to, because that's not a workable model. They can't retain good people. And I'm here to tell you, it's just like bands of five white guys. Like there've been some great bands of five white guys, but we're done already. Okay. Enough with the five white guys. And I think that's obvious, you know, look at, look at the, the popular bands, uh, certainly in the indie world, you know, it's, it's nothing but awesome young women and gay people, transgender people, you know, it's like we, we have a diverse world and I think we're better for it. Okay. Leslie, you wanna share an organization? Sure. Community for you? Um, I tell a lot of young women who are, wanna be involved or want to join panels that, where they can learn, I tell them about Digital Divas and Cameo and Amanda have done an amazing job this year. I've learned a lot from some of the panels they've done recently. Um, Women in Music, She is the Music, and Tracy Gershon and Beverly Keel and I started Change the Conversation in 2013. And, you know, before COVID, we were doing a lot of panels where, and they were educational, you know, it was, it was everything to help female artists and young females that are in the industry. And we heard so many horror stories from women, you know, especially artists of things that program directors would say to them or music directors or their own label. And there's not an H, who are they going to go to? There's no HR that they can go to. So we really started it for that where it could be a safe space. And 
again, some of the things that we heard and it still goes on today. And we're really trying to help a lot of the young women and young artists that are in the industry. So you can, we're on all socials. It's changed the convo. Okay, thank you, Molly. I'm definitely missing the industry in real life um, moments right now where I'd probably have a chance to get together with most of you and, and have that real social time that, you know, I think our industry has given a lot of women as we've, you know, been developing through our careers. Um, and this is more acute tonight than ever. Um, but um, one of the, the organizations that's helped me personally um, it was a, a program I did through an organization called the Impact Center out of Washington, D.C. And it gave me a chance to do some deep sort of personal development, career development work um, with a, a cohort of 24 other women of all different industries. And that exposure um, with some of them were doctors. One was a Ph.D. from John Hopkins with an M.D., you know, hedge fund managers, people in, in political life. And it was a tremendous to, to hear all of the same challenges and frustrations and fears and successes that you that we had in common. Um, I'll, I'll send the link around so we can share that um, to the, the panel attendees. Um, because I think for people, there were people probably in their the earliest part of their career, maybe their, their late 20s, early 30s, and then well into 40s and 50s. Um, and I think, or any journey in, in your career. Um, and I think that's something to, to hold on to um, for all of us is that, you know, there's always work to do um, and always development to, to do no matter what stage you're in. Four minutes, last question. <laughs> and then we're gonna close out. What advice would you give to your younger self or what wisdom do you just wanna share in general? Or what can we look for from you or your organization in the future? Last question. Pick one. Cameo, you're thinking. Let's go. <laughs> you know, it's it's tough. I've been given a lot of great advice over the years. And I think um, probably the most impactful thing that I could tell somebody else, it was the most impactful thing for me, was just that it is okay to be yourself in whatever that looks like. Um, and it sounds simple, but that's not easy when you're young and you don't know how to express yourself, have confidence, some of these other things that we've talked about. Um, and just figuring out what that looks like for yourself is really important. Portia? Sorry, my kid was yelling in the background, so I had to mute. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I feel like I, I, I choose different things on different days as my piece of advice, but I feel like today my piece of advice is, um, like, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Try things, even if you're not totally sure that you're right or that you're going to get it right or perfect or, or you're, you know, you know, beforehand the exact outcome. You know, I think trying and, and making an effort and taking an opportunity, even if it's not exactly fitting in with your, you know, preconceived notion of how things were going to go in your life is really critical because I've, I've heard just way too many people who overthink everything about their future and say, well, I can't even take a step because that step might be wrong. And I'm like, okay, well, then you might just want to look into like nun, nunnery like monastery life, <laughs> you know, try something that doesn't involve going outdoors, you know, like you, you have to make an effort. Like you have to put your stuff out there because that's the other thing is nobody is ever going to help you if you don't put yourself out there to be helped. I like that. I always say, get, put yourself in the way. Leslie. You know, I had learned early on from an old boss about not being defined by any one thing or be defined by your job. And I really learned that lesson. The radio station I talked about earlier where I was there for 17 years, well, a company took it over in the final year that I was there and they didn't renew my contract and five other people. And instead of being you know, devastated, I decided I wasn't gonna be defined by this one radio station. And the thing that I did that really helped me was I took the focus off of myself 
and focused on the other people that were displaced and tried to help and find them jobs. And when I did that, three months later, I got an amazing job. And it was from me not focusing on myself, but I think it would be not to be defined okay. by any one thing. Molly? I'm so inspired by all of your, your thoughts. And, um, and I, I could, kind of what I was saying earlier, I mean, just keep, keep pushing yourself to learn more, um, keep your mind open, um, you know, listen, change your mind when you realize maybe you didn't know everything that you thought you did when you were 25. Um, and 25 years later, you might realize you know a lot more and, and acknowledge that and maybe be open for that. Be, be open to, to all of those realities. The openness all is right. so important. Think about what this industry looked like when we all started. You know, every job I've had for 20 years didn't exist before I took it because the industry has changed so much. And, and it's such an important point, Molly. That's a great point. All of these points have been great. And I hope that everyone's watching has enjoyed every word from every woman. Thank well, you. Thank you. Music. Thank you, Gina. Thank you. you no. did a great job. No. Thank Listen. you, Gina. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Awesome. My pleasure. Absolutely. So thank you, Women in Music. We appreciate you for sponsoring you. this panel. And to these leading ladies <laughs> in the music industry, I say thank you. And we will see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.